Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop. Today we are restoring this plane. It used to look like this though, so let's dive in. This plane looks to be in horrible shape, and it is, but it's almost all there. It's missing a chunk out of the horn on the tote, uh, and the lateral adjuster is missing the wheel on the top. But both of those are things we can fix. Everything in this is functional, just really needs to be cleaned up, and it is loaded with gunk. So first thing we're going to do is take this apart and find out where are the problems, what are things that we need to solve, what pieces do we need to get, and uh, what can we do to make this thing better. It all needs a, a lot of attention and oil and everything was a bit tight but it's kind of one of those things you wiggle it around until it pops loose and you know that doesn't look horrible just not great <laughs> for most of this it's just going to need a lot of cleaning uh, that was actually held in place you can see there's tar over on the far side that got into the plane as well as the the paint that you need to have on any antique plane. Uh, and then somewhere underneath there, there is Japaning. Uh, this screw was so seized up that it was it was a pain to, to pull out. Um, I also wanted to make sure we got the yoke off of here. And then I'm also gonna be taking the frog lever off of this as well because I'm gonna be putting a new frog lever on it that has a new wheel. Uh, in the end, I actually ended up getting a wheel from another frog lever that was broken and put it on this one. To get the screw out, um, I put in a small notch in the end, and then I could come in with a hacksaw and cut in a slot, and this will allow me to turn it out. Um, I could put protection on the end of a pair of, of vice grips, and that most of the time will do it, but this is one I find that works out really, really well, uh, especially if you can get a little bit of penetrating oil in there. Keep the pressure on it, don't let it twist out, and go to town up. And yes, they are reverse threads. Left hand, isn't it great? <laughs> We're going to take every little piece out of this that we can uh, with, a, with a few exceptions. But in, because I'm even taking the lateral adjuster off of this one, it's going to be just about everything. We're going to take it over to the sink and scrub it. We're getting rid of all of the, the gunk and the buildup and anything we can to, to run it down. I have a brass wire brush that gets off most of it, and we want to then go through and dry everything as quickly as we can. This tar on the side was so built up and so heavy that I'm going to have to do a good bit to get at this. And the more I'm looking at this Japaning, the more I'm realizing there's just not as much there. Usually I'm going to try and leave it alone, but in this case I'm going to have to take it back a good ways. Most of this I, I like to remove with the wire brush. Uh, having the, the wheel on here actually goes really quickly and leaves you with a decent patina afterwards. It doesn't completely tear it down. It just gives you that, that nicer look you're going for. And so most of these pieces, I'm just going to take over to the wire wheel and, and buff them down. Um, for some of the really heavy duty stuff that's going to take a lot to get off, we will take that over and, and sandblast it. But the wire wheel is, is phenomenal at getting most everything on this. If you have little pieces that are hard to hold on to, a pair of vice grips are a, a lifesaver or a, a finger saver when things slip and run off. But this is just one of those really satisfying things that it's it's amazing to watch all the gunk come off and underneath you actually have something that's, that's semi-usable. For all of this uh, asphalt and tar, I'm just going to be basically chiseling it off and, and chipping away um, using a, a screwdriver and an old chisel that is um, beat up. Now, normally I would take this to a friend who has a really good sandblaster. I only have this small compressor down in the corner that isn't all that great. But uh, with a good head whack, we can get rid of most of it. And this is fantastic for removing the, uh, the, the rust and any of the, the buildup on there. The paint actually comes off well with this. Uh, but with the small compressor and using a, a softer bit, it just won't get into the, uh, the, the Japaning in that much. You can still see there's probably about 80 to 70% of the Japaning on there. But because we sandblasted it, it kind of smoothed out the edges and I can bring in new Japaning. Uh, this is Japaning that is pre-mixed uh, from A Plain Life. I'll try and leave a link to that down below. I have a couple videos making my own. If you want to make your own, go to Hand Tool Rescue. He has the definitive video on making Japaning. Uh, really, really good series. Uh, but if you just want to make your, if you want to buy your own, you can do this. And this can will probably redo several planes. I want to go in and hit every spot that would have Japaning, and I don't want to hit the spots that wouldn't, but there's going to be a little bit of bleed over, and that's okay. We're going to come back and clean that off. Now, here's the controversial thing. I'm going to put this in our family's oven. Yeah, 
this stuff smells bad, but it actually dissipates really quickly. I'm going to start off at 200 for an hour, and then I'm going to bump it up to 300 for an hour, and then I'm going to bump it up to 400 for an hour, and then I'm going to turn it off and let it cool down as, as it goes. Um, some people actually like to let it cool off in between each of those stages, um, but I haven't found too much of a difference in that. Any of these solid surfaces, I'm going to come in with a very, very fine file and clean off any of the Japaning that might stick on or any crud, and I want to take them back to just about there. You can see the difference. That might look like rust, but it's just the, the color balancing on the, the camera. It's actually a really nice, smooth um, surface on there. For the frog, uh, there was uh, some buildup on there, and I'm going to come through the file and hit a lot of it, but then I was realizing there was, there was quite a bit of out of flat on this, and since I don't have a lateral adjuster on it, it makes it really easy. I can just take it over to my coarse stone and spin it around on there, and I get a nice, clean surface. We're going to put on the new lateral adjuster. I'm going to put it through and put a punch on the back to expand the back side of it, and that will hold it in place. Be very, very careful when working with the cast iron. It is very easy to chip it out and break it, and so you want to, to take your time on that. We're going to put the new depth adjuster back in, work the yoke in, and make sure that that spins nicely. And then we can start putting things back together. And this is where things really start to become a lot of fun. But it's around this point that I'm, I'm thinking about, mm, I still need to work on those wooden parts. On any metal on metal surface, you're going to want to oil it, especially on any surface that could be rusting in the future. More oil, more oil is better. I did end up deciding to put a uh, a fine depth adjuster on this one. Um, the the original one, the the stud was wearing down a good bit, and putting this in is phenomenal. If you want to see these, there's a, a link on my my website. Um, Reed Plains sells them and uh, they are phenomenal for this. So for the wood parts, I need to scrape off all of the tar that got on them and all of the paint and the half finish using the side of a chisel and a card scraper uh, really do a quick bang up job of getting rid of most of the material in this. And I'm just taking off anything that, that feels lumpy at this point. We're going to come back through and actually do the file and cleaning up on it uh, once we add on the, the missing pieces. And the horn on this is missing. I've done a couple videos on actually replacing the horn and it's a little scary. Um, but it, it actually is relatively simple. These knobs and totes are made of rosewood, and they are old rosewood, and I have uh, some um, new uh, Bolivian rosewood um, that is uh, newer and, and far more sustainable, um, and so we're going to be using that for a piece of it, and it's going to be slightly different because it's not aged, but uh, we'll work with that. I love using the bow sander and files, and it just allows me to, to cut down into it. This one needed a lot more work to, to smooth things out, and so it ends up making it a little bit smaller, but not enough you would really feel it. I want to get rid of any of the marks left over from the, uh, the, the card scraper or the edge of the chisel. But before we go too far, uh, let's bring back over here. And I want to plane a perfectly flat and smooth surface on the top of this that we can then grab a chunk of rosewood and put a piece into that. I'm going to cut off a small block that is a little larger than we need, and make sure one of the surfaces on that are perfectly smooth. I can mark it out and cut it just like any other piece, uh, but for this we are going into rosewood, and a lot of people really worry about rosewood because it is a little more of an oily wood. Um, and, and Yeah, that's something to kind of think about, but it, it's not a huge issue. You don't have to worry about too much, especially if you're going to be using epoxy. In this one, I'm going to be using Total Boat High Performance Epoxy on here. I want to make sure there's a really good seam between the two. I don't want anything bumping out. This one had a little bit of a bulge in the top, and so I ended up having to do uh, some file work to get it down nice and smooth. So here you can see some of the epoxy coming out, and we're going to mix this up and apply it on. And this is um, this is kind of a scary moment of, oh no, what if it's in the wrong place? And that's why I make the block bigger than it needs to be, so that I can work back with it. The nice thing with epoxy is you don't need a lot of clamping force. You can just put a couple rubber bands on as long as it's held in place and set it aside, and then it's good. Come back the next day and we can start cutting things out. I'm going to draw out approximately what I want and then I'm going to use a couple saws to get down close to the line. I'm going to stay away from it, just kind of get as close to it. Most of the work I'm going to be doing with some cabinet rasps. And if you've never used a good hand-stitched cabinet rasp, they are absolutely amazing. And I'm going to do 90% of the work with one of these and just take it down close to the shape I want. 
coming back and forth and trying from different angles and different styles. And there are a whole bunch of these that are um, all different in, in shape and orientation and grit. And so we're going to be working through these and slowly getting on to finer and finer files and getting closer to our shape. And you can see how that, that seam, you can still see it. And it will show up even more when finish comes on. But as of right now, it's actually really close. And I'm loving this. As we go along, I'm going to stop and feel it and stop and feel it, and, and I'm going to make sure everything is close to what I want. You'll notice that the hole we ended up covering up, so I'm going to come back with a quarter inch that is the main shaft going all the way through, and I'm just going to go until the tip just barely touches out. Once it touches out, I'm going to turn this around, and I'm going to put in an eighth inch hole, and this will allow me to put in the large auger bit because we need a large hole on this side for the brass fitting to go in and fit down into use a gouge to clear anything out of there and now we have down to the old seat where the brass fitting will fit onto this. For the finish on this it's going to be boiled linseed oil and paste wax. Um, I could put on a shellac or a varnish or other things like that but honestly for something that goes in the hand I love the feeling of just putting on the boiled linseed oil, let it soak up as much as it wants, put a couple layers, layers of that on there and uh, then polish off anything that's still on the surface and then apply paste wax. Put it on, let it soak in, and then polish it off. And I love the, the feeling of it. In this case, you can still see the paste wax is on there and curing. And I'm going to come back in a little bit with a rag and polish that down. Then we can start putting everything together. Ooh, I should have used a different screwdriver on that one. <laughs> For uh, most of this, we're going to just... Um, put it back the way it was, but we're going to make sure everything is sharpened and tuned up right. And if you want to know how to do that, I've got a bunch of videos on how to sharpen and tune a plane. Um, everything just is, is take it step by step and treat it just like any other plane. We're going to come back in and polish off that wax that was left on there and then take it for a test drive. Can we get full width shavings on this number seven? And yes, and very, very pleasing as they go. I'm loving these oak curls coming off of here. And uh, yeah, this board was actually considerably out of flat, so it took several shavings to get all the way down. It was hitting at one end and not the other, and, and now it's hitting all the way across. And I am really, really happy with how this came out. This is a, a, a pretty plane with a lot of history, and it's going to have a lot more to come. Another 100 years on the shelf, and lots more fun. There you have it. I really like how this came out. Uh, just kind of redoing it, still maintaining a little bit of that original aesthetic. I, I really really like how this came out. It is very, very pretty, especially with the uh, replacement on there. I, I like how that came out. This is going to be very, very happy. So I'm sending this off to a viewer in the channel um, who I'm actually trading something for. So thank you. If you have any other questions about this, throw them in the comments, but I do have a whole bunch of videos on restoring planes and I've done every step in this four or five times and I probably have individual videos on most every step on this. So if you wanna see that, I'll try and leave a few links down below. But otherwise, let me know your questions and I'll answer as many of those as I can get to because it does help me out. Any to me put a question down below. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments, snide remarks, even just putting comment down below. Thank you. <laughs> helps us get in front of more people, helps the channel grow and really means a lot. So if you want to help out with that, well, uh, you know what to do. If you want to go even farther though and really help out the channel, all these names over here, those are the fantastic, wonderful, benevolent and gorgeous people over on Patreon. Because without patrons, we wouldn't be here. You guys support us, whether it be through memberships or patrons or just hitting the thank you button. Uh, thank you. You keep the lights on. You allow me to be able to do things like this and put out content almost every day. So I hope you like that. And if you'd like to find out more, you know what to do. Links below, description. Yeah. <laughs> I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. This is an absolute perfect perfection of a restoration. You know how I know that? Because it's a number seven. <laughs>